Welcome to Music in Mind Live. I'm Renee Fleming. Today we're welcoming Dr. Anirudh Patel, an expert on evolution in music. And I'm especially excited about this episode because evolution can help to explain just why music, movement, our appreciation for beauty, and desire to create are so potent. In fact, it was only when I heard Dr. Patel speak early on in my own search for understanding that I had the aha moment I needed to actually believe that science and the arts belong together. Dr. Patel is a professor of psychology at Tufts University where he studies the cognitive, neural, and evolutionary foundations of music. Much of his work is focused on the relationship between music and language. He's the author of Music, Language, and the Brain, which won the 2008 ASCAP Deems Taylor Award. ASCAP, by the way, is one of the two major associations of songwriters, composers, and music publishers. More recently, Ani has been studying how other species process musical rhythm and melody in order to gain insights into the evolutionary history of human musicality. He's currently writing a book on this subject with fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation and the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard. He's a past president of the Society for Music Perception and Cognition and a fellow in the Azrieli Program for Brain, Mind, and Consciousness at the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. Before we begin, remember to submit questions in the comments section on Facebook. And we're delighted to have had an audience of more than 300,000 people watching from 58 different countries around the world. Thank you. I've also asked the audience to submit videos or photos highlighting a person or program working at the intersection of arts and science through the note on my Facebook page entitled, We Want to Hear From You. And we've been getting great submissions and wanna share one now. This is Royal College of Music graduate, soprano Louise Fuller singing with her dog, Monty. And we're gonna discuss this later with Dr. Patel. Yes, Louise, I know what it's like to be in a competitive environment. <laughs> <laughs> and good luck with your career. You both have lovely voices. And now I'd like to welcome my guest, Dr. Ani Patel. So Ani, you've spent your career following fascinating questions about the genesis of music. Can you tell us something about your background and how you got here? Absolutely. Um, I am a biologist by training. And in my senior year of undergraduate college, when I was casting about for what behavior I wanted to study from a biological perspective, um, it kind of hit me in a light bulb moment that what really fascinated me was music. And I, I loved music. I was a musician. I played in the school band. And, but those two parts of my life were just completely separate, biology and a deep love of that, and music and a deep love of that. And then it was one of these weird moments where it's suddenly like, wow, you can actually maybe make those talk to each other and think about how you can study music as a biologist. And that is how I started down the road of studying the neuroscience of music. We're so glad you did. Uh, was there an aha moment for you? Was there something that really inspired you? Um, in terms of that connection? Yes. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those mysterious moments. I can remember the moment I was walking through uh, the lawn at the University of Virginia and the idea of putting those two things together just hit like a, I don't know, brick, a light bulb, I don't know. Uh, but why exactly? I guess it's one of those mysterious questions. Like why do composers get an idea all of a right. sudden? Right, yeah, inspiration, pretty, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. So, so let's start with what science currently knows about our evolution in music. Tell us what we know so far. Well, this is a tricky question to study. There's lots of opinions going back to Darwin. Um, Darwin himself, in his book, The Descent of Man, spent several pages uh, talking about music. He thought it was such an important human behavior that he felt he had to devote some time to thinking about it. 
and concluded that it must be something that we evolved to do because um, it's universal, it's so powerful. Um, and then people immediately started to push back. Uh, and it's been this fierce debate ever since then. Um, it, right back to Darwin, people saying, no, you know, music is wonderful and it's, it's a great human invention. We all treasure it, but it's not anything we particularly evolved to do. It's not part of our evolutionary history. It's a cultural invention like reading and writing um, or you know, uh, tool manufacture, things like that. Um, and it's been a difficult debate to solve because there's very little hard evidence in the sense of archeology. span I mean, the oldest instruments are surprisingly old, but, um, but that doesn't prove that music is somehow built into human nature. Um, so one of the first things that I learned in, in the uh, conference that uh, the NIH gave early on in this, this project was about the bone flute, the yes. 40,000 year old bone flute. So help us understand what, what the significance, significance of that discovery uh, was and also you know, yeah. what does that mean 40,000 years? Well, okay, so the, when we see things going that far back in human history, it does suggest that this is a very, very ancient behavior. And it does kind of push back a little bit against the idea that music like, I don't know, weaving or textiles or things like that are, is a recent invention of human culture. Um, and it's hard to wrap your head around just how long ago 40,000 years is. I mean, I wonder if we could show our little timeline because this is something that really helped bring it home to me um, that shows ancient civilizations and how they kind of line up in the timeline of history to give us a sense of how old 40,000 years ago is. It's hard for us to really comprehend, isn't it? Yeah. Do we have that slide or that image? So uh, when we think back actually oh. to that period of time, what else was happening then? Okay, so this I should point out was 30,000 years before agriculture, before people were living in cities. This was the ice age. It was a very difficult time in uh, human evolutionary history. Um, it's so long ago that we were not the only human species on the planet. Neanderthals were still alive, believe it or not. Um, so I so, understand Neanderthals had the same vocal apparatus I do. That's one of the current theories, yeah. And so possibly they sang as well. Um, and uh, so, you know, woolly mammoths were still around to give you some idea. Uh, and so this is a difficult time in human life in this, in this part of Europe, uh, the Ice Age, and yet people were making musical instruments. I mean, you'd think, wow, you know, if you're going to make something, make a sphere, make a uh, right. make something that's going to help you survive. So, but they're driven to make musical instruments, and of course, musical instruments are probably not the oldest form of music. S singing is all over the world. Every culture has singing, even if they don't make musical instruments. So, oh, here's our timeline. Yeah, singing probably goes back even further. Okay, so if you can see this timeline, what I like about this timeline is it shows you some of the ancient civilizations, the ancient Egyptians, the ancient Greeks. Um, you know, when the ancient Greek philosophers lived, the ancient Indian civilizations, that's all those colored boxes on the right of the, uh, of the image. And, and then going to the left, you see the Stone Age in gray, and, and you can see that everything we think of as kind of history um, is all on the right there. Uh, you know, Pythagoras and Aristotle and Socrates and, and the ancient Indian epics. And then at the far left is 10,000 years, and that's already way back in this timeline. Now, this bone flute is from 40,000 years ago to give you some sense of how long ago that instrument was made. So we are talking about a very ancient human behavior, which kind of is one of the things that makes people think, hey, maybe this is a behavior that is something that we evolved to do. It's not just an arbitrary product of human culture. I mean, it has a huge cultural component, of course, but maybe there's a spark of it in, our, in human nature. So I always imagine that um, people use sounds to hunt, that vocalize, you know, mimicking uh, various birds and animals for hunting purposes. Mm -hmm. Is that possible? Yes, and you still see that in people who live kind of a traditional foraging hunting lifestyles. They, they use sounds to call animals or to uh, attract animals. And so how the original impulse to make music started is a bit of a mystery. Um, but what's happening now that's kind of neat is we're starting to use evidence from neuroscience and from studies of other species and how they process music to get clues about whether or not we have become a musical species over time through evolution. So the evolution question I think is really interesting too and you used a great analogy when we were speaking you know we evolved to walk um, you know we can swim but we yes. didn't evolve to swim can you kind of explain that a little bit talking and speaking and all of that yes it absolutely helps yeah. Yeah, so to give you the intuition, so evolutionary biologists like to know what are the traits that humans evolved to have. And um, 
versus what are the traits that are complete inventions of human culture. So for example, when you look at our body, our biology, it's clear that we evolved to walk, right? We are bipedal by nature. Our, if you look at our skeleton, it's, it's clearly shaped to support that kind of locomotion. It's very different from a chimpanzee skeleton in ways that make it easy for us to walk on two legs. Um, and so we have evolved as a walking species, as part of us, our human nature, our biology. Um, but as far as we know, we did not evolve to swim. And now we can swim and we love to swim and there are cultures where it's important to swim, but it's not something that we evolved to do. It's, it's a wonderful thing that we can do with this body of ours. And so you can take that same kind of dichotomy, that contrast and say the same, ask the same question about talking versus music. It clearly seems like we evolved to talk Talk. Our brains seem specialized for learning how to talk. I think babies learn how to learn it sort of effortlessly, even though it's very complicated. Um, and but did we evolve to sing, or is singing a bit like swimming? Is it something a wonderful thing we can do, but it's not anything that we specifically evolved to do? And this goes right to the heart of the debate. And I love it's singing because um, this Me analogy. Too. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> that's what Darwin talked about. He thought that we sang. Our ancestors sang even before we spoke. Uh, kind of to attract mates the way birds sing. So had, speaking of mates, what about seduction? Because that's often brought up as a cause potentially for evolution yes. and music. And that's very much Darwin's idea. Music as a kind of uh, ornamental way of attracting, uh, kind of like the way the peacock's tail attracts a mate. He thought that singing was a beautiful sound you made to attract a mate. And he, uh, to his credit, he thought both ancient males and females sang um, to each other. Uh, it's sort of a charming vision. Um, but that's sort of singing for others and like birds do when they try to sing to attract a mate. Right now, there's a lot of interest in the idea that if we did evolve to sing, it wasn't singing for others. It was to sing with others. It was participatory. Social cohesion. Um, yeah, that singing was a way of bringing people together and making them feel unified as part of a group and overcoming the kinds of conflicts that we all have in the groups that we live in. Um, by putting so I love this recent study that pointed out that performers and audience can synchronize actually their brain activity in a performance. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because there's this new line of research on neuroscience looking at how what happens in the performer's brain and what happens in the listener's brain gets aligned. Um, so even when you're not singing along, perhaps your brain is sort of internally synchronizing and singing along. So anyway, this idea of participatory musicality uh, rather than performative musicality is really getting a lot of attention in theorizing about evolution and music. That maybe making music with others was a, uh, a way to connect with them on an emotional level that is, goes beyond what we can do by just talking to each other. So there's a reason why song has accompanied most major um, events in over time and help people to process also uh, really tragic events as well. It's, it's too bad we're not able to sing together right now. Oh, that's so true. Yeah, that's so true. I and mean, you think about there are times when something tragic has happened um, and people come together and it's just not at all uncommon for them to sing because somehow that expresses something that they just can't say in words it, and unifies them in ways that they just goes beyond what, what we can do with language. So what, is there a music room in the brain? And can you, with that, discuss the impact of music on language processing? Sure, yeah, there's been this neat work in the recent years, um, some of it coming out of MIT, suggesting that there are regions of the brain that seem selectively activated by music that seem to be specifically um, involved in music processing. And so and that's interesting because it's not true that there's a specific region of the brain for every kind of sound we hear, like there's not a, specific region that only responds when we hear car horns or when we hear um, bird song or something. Uh, and yet there seems to be a specific region that really cares about music. And we also know this happens for language. So again, this is a clue from neuroscience that maybe this is something that evolution felt was important enough to kind of build in uh, to our brains. Now, um, that being said, it's music is a very complicated brain activity that uses many brain regions. And the fact that one region or a couple of regions seem very selective for music doesn't mean that music is an island in the brain cut off from everything else. When you engage in music, you use many brain areas. These selective areas are one, but it also you use areas that seem to overlap with other important brain functions like memory, attention, language. And so what's exciting about those connections is it suggests that music can be harnessed as a way to help people that have problems in those domains, um, but either through brain damage or through developmental disorders recovering language after a stroke or um, you know, 
improving melodic their attention. intonation therapy, which helps people recover <laughs> speech. Yes, yeah. uh, through singing. again yeah. through singing. Yes. Yeah. So exactly. child children really fascinate me in this uh, in this area because I have two clips to share with you. Um, these are very yeah. very young children responding emotionally to music and one with uh, responding to sadness and the other pure joy and it's a favorite of mine and all of the people that I present to. So yeah. we're going to play these two videos for you and get your response. I'm glad the first the twins came on because the first one makes me cry too. Uh, oh my gosh, those are really wonderful. The first one reminds me um, that Darwin, who again was interested in music, actually did sort of experiments on music in his baby son Willie when he was an infant. His wife Emma was a very good pianist, and he had her play Willie when he was an infant sad music and versus happy music on the piano, and he recorded his responses in, in his notebook and found that he cried at sad music and laughed at happy music. And these are purely instrumental pieces. And Willie's an infant. He hasn't had a lifetime of experience learning music. Right. And this really intrigued Darwin about the idea that our emotional responses to music are tapping into something really deep inside us. Um, there are lots of videos like this on YouTube and they're fascinating to look at. And you just know that no one taught these children, you're supposed, this is a sad song, you're supposed to yeah. be sad. Right. Uh, and, and the response is slow. It takes a while. And yeah. the focus is so intense. I, I just love yeah. it. Yeah, so yeah. in order to understand more about our evolutionary attraction to music, you've studied birds and other animals. So let's mm -hmm. start with your senior star, Snowball. Okay. Quite 8 million views on YouTube. And he's 24 years old now. He's been a favorite of audiences in my presentations all over the world. So here's a clip of him showing us 14 different dance moves. I wish I were this creative. Yeah, I would, I would say creative and flexible. So <laughs> please explain this. I mean, he's not mimicking anything. Is that correct? No, those, those were all moves made without anybody dancing in the room, just him. Um, so Snowball came to light because there was some interest back in the, like, 2008 or nine, whether or not any other animal shared our sense of beat to music. And the big surprise was we don't seem to share this sense of beat with other primates. And everybody thought, oh, beat is the most basic aspect of music. And if we share anything with other animals, it'll be the sense of rhythm and beat. Other primates don't seem to get beat, uh, surprisingly. And um, whereas some birds do, and Snowball came to light because he seemed to be actually moving to the beat of music spontaneously, never was trained to do it, just as a pet. Um, so we did a proper study where we tested whether he could keep the beat when you slowed it down and sped up the music and didn't have anybody dancing, and he could. And then this last year, 2019, we published this other study showing that not only does he keep the beat, um, he also has a lot of creativity and flexibility in the way he moves to music. And we think all of this is because Snowball, like humans, has the ability to share in the world, which is the ability to imitate complicated sounds. So when you sing, um, you have to imitate the sounds you hear, um, and this seems natural to us. This actually takes some very specialized neural hardware 
most animals, including all other primates, dogs, cats included, I mean, not, they're not primates, but other, other, most animals we're familiar with, um, have innate calls. They don't learn to sing based on, or, to, or vocalize based on experience. When you can learn to imitate sounds, you have very sophisticated connections and processing abilities in hearing and movement and the ability to connect those. And when you feel a beat in music, you're connecting hearing and movement in sophisticated ways too. So we think imitating sound lays the foundation for being able to feel beat and move beat to the beat. And that's the significance of this snowball research. It's kind of a, an example of how you can study some of the evolutionary foundations of musicality without archaeology. It's by looking at brains and looking at other animals. Oh, that's an, that's amazing and also very surprising. I would have we all would imagine that primates would share more in common with us in terms exactly. of response to music. Yeah, um, I just got more amazed over the years. I mean, Snowball is more closely related to a T Rex than he is to a human being in terms of evolutionary <laughs> genetic relatedness, and yet he's doing this behavior that you don't even see in our closest primate cousins. And so um, it's wow. bizarre that I think we think that this vocal learning is key to this uh, resemblance between them and us. So, and you're one of the fortunate recipients of, of the NIH Sound Health Grant for your work on bird perception of rhythmic patterns. So tell us what you're hoping to find. Yes, so uh, we were very fortunate to uh, benefit from this new NIH program to study music and health um, that you helped uh, instigate and inspire. So thank you. Um, and we're taking this work into the lab now. Snowball is a pet, so he's not really a, a laboratory uh, uh, animal. Um, but there are small birds that are studied uh, in neuroscience, they're called zebra finches. They're very widely studied because they can also imitate complex sounds. So they have some of the same hearing motor circuitry uh, kind of connections that we see in us and in parrots. And we're just testing them for their ability to perceive rhythm. Can they perceive like the difference between say a metronome and an irregular rhythm? It seems like such a simple discrimination for us. But um, some animals have trouble with that, believe it or not. Uh, and, but we're finding that they A, they can do it and they can, they can learn it, they can generalize, they can recognize recognize it in new tempi that they haven't heard before. So it suggests that they, their brains kind of get the concept of rhythm, even if they don't dance to rhythm. And we want to use the, the tremendous neuroscience knowledge we have about these bird brains to start to dissect the, um, or un unpack the relationship between how the hearing centers and the motor centers interact in beat perception, which is very difficult to do in humans um, in terms of precise measurements. And we, we hope that what we learn will actually be relevant to some human disorders like Parkinson's, where music with a beat can help people to walk and uh, move in ways that they have great difficulty doing otherwise. I was amazed to learn, for instance, that some birds can pass on their own familiar songs to their young. So yeah. unique songs, actually. Yes. Um, it's highly sophisticated. And talk about the Eastern Meadowlark. Oh, okay. So this is, this is neat. So there's, this is a great example of how studying kind of musical behavior in other animals can teach us surprising things. So Birds in some ways are even more musical than we think they are. So I have this example I like to show of an Eastern meadowlark. And this is a bird um, that sings a song that you would hear in nature. And there's actually more richness and complexity and musicality in this song than you realize just listening at the normal speed you hear it. So I wanna play it at the normal speed you'd hear it if you were walking around in the field and then slow it down five times. And when you slow it down, you'll hear some notes you don't even hear when you play it at the normal rate. There's this little note run, like a little musical scale that kind of comes out and you can hear when you listen to it slow down because that's presumably what other birds are hearing. So if it's possible to play that, that would be really cool. I think that's the one at normal speed. That's the slow down one. I don't know if you heard that little note run sort of towards the end, like a little musical scale and it's shown in this picture, uh, if you can see the picture. Um, of this picture of sound called a sonogram. But anyway, so anyway, in some ways, birds are even more musical than we think they are. But there's ways that are su they're surprisingly different from us. So there's been a line of research showing that one of the core aspects of human musicality that we completely take for granted, which is we recognize tunes, whether they're transposed up or down. So if you sing an aria one day in one key, and then the next day you sing it at another key, uh, somebody will recognize it as the same aria. If you're singing higher one day and lower the next, effortlessly recognize it as the same aria. Um, you think, we think that's just basic and simple for aspect of hearing. Turns out birds can't do that. They can learn to recognize a melody, a human melody at a particular level and tell it from another melody. But then if you transpose those up or down, they completely don't recognize it anymore. They have to relearn it as if it's a brand new melody. And so why does this come so easily to us when other animals that have sophisticated sound processing and even sing don't do it? 
And this is where it gets interesting because what, what good would that be, that, that ability in human brain? Well, if you think about it, one of the things that, let, that lets us do is sing together. Because when men and women sing together, our voices are in different ranges. And if we want to feel like we're singing the same melody, we have to recognize that the melody sung up here can be the same as the melody that's sung down here if they're moving in the same way. It's called relative pitch, uh, same relative pitch. So we effortlessly can bring our voices together because we have this ability. And again, that supports an aspect of human music. Um, so. Well, this explains why you've gone to the dogs. And I'm sorry I had to say it that way, <laughs> but um, I, I wanna share my own experience with this. I, had a, I sang sure. on stage at the Metropolitan Opera in Massenet's opera Manon. And a Russian wolfhound was one of the, uh, was with an extra on stage. And this was a scene, really a showcase scene, uh, this aria. And the entire chorus and everybody on stage was in what we call tableau position, which means frozen. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm singing and I'm thinking, what is that sound? I think somebody is making fun of me backstage. <laughs> Maybe it's, you know, somebody working backstage for the first time who doesn't understand that we can hear them. It was a right. very high voice. I would say a quite beautiful tone. Uh, and um, suddenly I saw somebody walk off stage sheepishly with this huge dog, this Irish wolfhound. The entire audience burst out laughing. And I walked to the front of the stage when the curtain came down and I said to the management, it's the dog or me. So, <laughs> so you know, so, and this is, this was actually made into a children's book. Um, yeah. let's, let's play just a snippet of the aria. So if you can imagine me trying to sing this piece with this loud how howling. I so wish yeah. we had a dog howling along to that. So why do dogs howl? Explain, why are you looking at dogs howling at all? Yeah. I'm so glad we're talking about this because this is my new uh, study of animals and music. So uh, dogs seem to howl. Well, dogs are descended from wolves and wolves seem to howl for social reasons. They howl together as a pack to mark themselves as members of a pack, uh, to show how big the pack is, for example, to keep other packs away or to call members back. Um, and howling is an example of animals producing long notes at the same time, um, which is what we do when we sing with each other. It's very rare to see other, an other animals do this. And it opens an opportunity to ask a question about the evolution of musicality, which is when we sing together, one of the things we do all over the world is we, try, we care about how our pitches align with each other, right? We generally try to come into some sort of agreement with our pitches. Some people do it better than others, but there's a tendency to do that. <laughs> um, and so, for a long time, people have wondered, well, when dogs howl, it, are they listening to each other? Are they adjusting the pitches relative to each other? Some people think they're actually actively detuning from each other to sound like a larger pack, but that's still listening and adjusting. And it occurred to me, well, studying wolves in the wild, howling to them, each other is tricky. Um, <laughs> dogs howling uh, is easier. And it turns out that there are dogs who will reliably howl to certain things, including certain pieces of music. And this means you can do an experiment to see if they're actually listening and adjusting rather than just kind of letting loose at their innate howl pitch. Uh, you, you record them howling to the song they like to howl to, uh, which they will do happily. Um, and then you do that a few times and then you transpose that song up or down in pitch. And then you play that to them and see what happens when they howl. Will they shift their pitch up or down accordingly or do they stay at their native sort of some innate frequency? And if they shift, that would suggest a degree of voluntary control that people, that would really be surprising because people have often thought that howling is innate. You don't, they don't have much control over it. But you know, even if they have a little crude control, that could be the very beginnings of what we think of as singing together, right? Kind of the evolutionary origins of kind of vocalizing. And that gives a social signal that we're part of a group. Uh, and that could be one of the early ways that our singing got started. 
So Louise's dog, for instance, was clearly waiting for her to sing and then responding, you know? And so yeah. show us an example of this. Let's okay. see checkers. Uh, okay, so I can show you an example from uh, uh, the first dog that I studied in this experiment. So checkers is a dog who howls wonderfully to Wendels, uh, Mendelssohn's wedding march, okay? And uh, it's just wonderful to watch. Anyway, I have a video of checkers howling to the wedding march in its original uh, form, and then the wedding march transposed down by three semitones. And he actually does howl lower when it's transposed down. Of course, it's one Let's dog. see the first one, Jason. <laughs> Okay, that's the first one. And then you'll see the one where he, uh, we transposed it down three semitones and to see what he would do. That is so clear. Yeah, right? And of course, it's one animal. So this, the critical thing is to see if this actually holds true more generally. So now we're actually actively recruiting dogs to participate. I've teamed up with a lab at Harvard that specializes in canine behavior and, uh, and cognition. And we've got a great team of undergrads working on this. And if anybody out there in, in this audience would, has a dog that howls to music and would like to participate, I invite you to email us at howlingstudy at gmail.com. Just one word, howlingstudy at gmail.com. And we'd love to have you involved in this work. We'll share this link as well. Uh, I'm sure you'll get a lot of takers. There are a lot of fantastic videos online. We'll share a couple of them at the end. Um, so what do you think the future of this is? What can we potentially learn about um, evolution and music in, in us? Well, I think we can potentially answer the big question that Darwin set us off to ask and answer that is, is musicality part of human nature? Um, or is it like swimming, a pleasant, Thing that we invented that we can do but it's not necessarily something that we evolved to do and for many years it seemed like this was something we would never be able to answer you know it's just a great question but we just don't have the ability to answer it but now with neuroscience and the ability to study other species and their responses to music and putting these things together and study baby responses to music um, and genetics even is becoming is starting to get into the picture are there genes that involve in musicality that look like they've been selected for i think the exciting things that Perhaps in our lifetime, we can get an answer to this question, whether or not musicality is part of human nature, which would be an amazing question to answer because uh, it might be the first case of something about the arts being sort of um, biologically part of human nature that would be, be able to show biologically, that we would be able to support with biological evidence. That would be amazing. Um, well, thank you so much, Ani. Let's take some questions from our audience. Uh, Rafaela from Oxford, England asks, what are the neurological effects of repetition or of a constant beat in humans or animals? Um, well, so the, one of the big ones, at least in humans, that we see is movement. Um, all over the world, people experience an impulse to move to music uh, when it has a beat. You see this in every culture. You see it starting very early in life. Um, and we think this is a powerful and important part of, of musicality is this motor aspect of musicality. And, and we think that when you're listening to music with a beat, even when you're not moving, we think that the motor system is involved in, in predicting the timing of beats. And so essentially, music is an odd sensory motor kind of behavior from the brain standpoint, even when you're sitting still. And that's why we think it has such power in things like Parkinson's disease, and we want to understand the actual mechanisms by which that works. Uh, Jennifer says, uh, I don't know if this is relevant, but I have a blind and deaf Great Dane and I communicate with her through touch. We mm -hmm. have a song. When I take her to the vet and she is nervous, I hold her close to my chest and sing, I belong with you by the Lumineers to her. And presumably she can feel the vibrations in my chest. The wow. vet says her heart slows down. But uh, if I sing anything else or just talk, it doesn't help. That is really interesting because it, it's about this how dogs will key in on certain pieces of music. And we see this in the howling, that, that some specific piece of music will trigger that dog and not others. We don't know what it is about that piece of music. That's a bit of a mystery. Does it sound like howling to the dog? Why do dogs have these musical preferences? We don't yes. know. 
Yeah. Uh, Paulina from Poland asks, my little friend, a four-year-old, is in love with the opera, imitates arias from TV well, and repeats my practicing correctly. She does not want to sing children's songs, though. Is there an explanation to this? <laughs> Sounds like a recruit for you, Renee. Yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> she has good taste. Yes, clearly. exactly. That, that's the end of that story. Yeah, exactly. It's, uh, it's hard to know why children are drawn to certain genres, but that is a wonderful story. Yes. Yeah. Um, Jessica wants to know, does opera bother dogs? This is a very good question, actually, because I did see this in the comments for howling dogs. Is, are they yeah. howling because it hurts their ears? Right. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, we don't think so because dogs are always free to leave, at least in the videos that we see. They're not being confined or held in place. Um, the experiment we do with checkers, he was free to leave at any time. He didn't leave. He stayed and howled. And uh, I just learned through one of your uh, people, Renee, about this video of a dog actually pounding on the keyboard with his paws and howling along and wagging his tail. Now, if howling to sounds is painful, why would a dog ever do that? Why would a dog <laughs> make the sound howl along and wag his tail? So I, I don't think it's, it's, it's unpleasant for the dogs. That thing sounds like fun, right? Yeah. Uh, are there any, this is from Anna Katering. She says, are there any animals that pick up on music more than others? Yes, I mean, this is why Snowball is so interesting because um, he seems to pick up on beat in ways we don't even see in other primates besides humans. And that's a big clue to, to us in terms of thinking about the evolution of this ability. So yes, uh, and birds pick up on melodies, as we know, and but in ways that are different from humans because of the thing I told you about not recognizing transposition. So it's really when you get down into the details, you begin to see how we're similar and how we're different from other animals in musicality and what that can teach us about the evolution of musicality. And one more, Pamela asks about pitch. Do animals mostly react to higher pitch sounds? Well, that's a good question. I think it depends on the animal. I mean, elephants actually communicate through infrasound, lower pitch sounds than you and I can hear. Um, but all over the, in many animals, high pitch sounds do serve as kind of alarms because they're so audible. And so yes, there's a certain general reaction, I would say to high pitch sounds. So it's interesting too, because, uh, and this is a question for me, there are a lot of uh, videos of elephants responding mm -hmm. to music and it's typically Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata factors quite often in these types of videos. Okay. Um, is, can music be soothing to animals that we under know or understand? Yeah, I think that's actually a, a question of real world importance because increasingly you're seeing music being marketed as you know music for your dog, music for your cat. And is it actually soothing to animals? We we, we don't know until we do some research because it's always possible that the way they hear it is not the way we hear it and maybe it's actually irritating them. So I actually teamed up with a, a, a team at the Tufts Vet School last summer to try and ask this question with a study. Uh, we had people bring their pet dogs into for a sort of uh, vet visit, simulated vet visit where the dog would come in with the owner and then be left in the room alone, which is anxiety provoking for a dog. And then we had some dogs hear this uh, music for dogs that we got from the commercial CDs and some hear just silence. And, and we, we are currently analyzing the data because we took video and we also tried to get some physiology measures to see if it's true that this music actually calms the dogs down physiologically and behaviorally. So we're, we're kind of looking at that now because um, I think it's tempting to think they hear music the same way we do and react to it the same way we do. But I think we need to show that that's true if we're going to start trying to use right. music for their benefit. True of everything, right? We have to really prove it. And uh, this is what science is for. Yeah. Um, so I actually do have some more questions. Robin wants to know about earworms. Why do certain pieces of music repeat themselves over and over in your head and it's hard to get them out? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, my colleague, Lisa Margulis, who's a professor at Princeton University, a music theorist who studies music cognition, has a uh, some neat stuff on the internet about that, uh, videos and so forth. I don't think we have a final answer yet, but I think one of the things that she's pointed out is that music is incredibly repetitive as, as a rule and compared to language, right? In language, we're told, don't repeat yourself. But in music, you know, like there are Beatles songs where they'll sing the same phrase nine times in a row. And, um, and we love it. it. It's wonderful. And it partly it's so wonderful because it makes us want to join in. And this gets back to the whole idea of vocalizing with others as something that we are attracted to kind of the way wolves howling together is something they find appealing. Repetition facilitates that kind of joining in aspect of participatory musicality as opposed to performative where one person performs and everybody else just listens. This is another theme of bringing people together uh, and sharing something. And the same is true then probably for animals that move in packs or in groups. 
Yeah. Uh, Rosalva in Tucson says, hi, Rosalva. Uh, I have owls in my backyard and I sing to them, especially in this time of social distancing. Is sound imitation a form of entrainment? Does the imitation of sound somehow direct us towards empathy? Oh, well, that's, that's such an interesting question. It's sort of like, what is the psychological consequence of, sing, of, of, of merging your sounds with others? A lot of people are looking at what happens to people's behavior after they sing with others, after they dance with others, after they move in synchrony with others, which are all part of normal music. And there's a, a lot of evidence suggesting that after these kinds of interactions, people are nicer to each other. They're um, more likely to help each other. Um, so there seems to be some way in which this promotes this sort of sense of connectedness and wanting mm. to uh, kind of build these bonds and, and interact in positive ways. That gives me goosebumps. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Patel. Thank you, Ani. Oh. Um, I, I'm so grateful that you joined us today. Um, please join us again next Tuesday at 5 p.m. via my Facebook page, Renee Fleming Music or the Kennedy Center YouTube channel. Episodes will be available to view later, though, if you miss the live webinar. To stay in the loop, don't forget to sign up for the newsletter at my Facebook page or my website, ReneeFleming.com. Um, we're going to have a few favorite, a little compilation of our favorite animal videos at the end, but I want to just quickly introduce next week. Next week, we'll focus on a group that led the way in the development of music and arts therapy, our veterans. Music therapy is a, a clinical discipline, arose largely in response to the needs of veterans in the First and Second World Wars. I'll be joined by three experts from Creative Forces, the National Endowment for the Arts, Military Healing Arts Network partnering with the U.S. Departments of Defense and Veterans Affairs, this program works to improve the health of service members exposed to trauma, as well as their families and caregivers. Creative Forces Director Bill, Bill O'Brien will discuss his work with NICO, the National Intrepid Center of Excellence at Walter Reed Military Medical Center, where arts therapies are being developed for traumatic brain injury and psychological health conditions, including PTSD. I'll also welcome Dr. Sarah Cass, Creative Forces Senior Military and Medical Advisor, who served 23 years in the Navy, including a final tour as Deputy Commander of NICO. And Donna Betts, PhD, currently the Creative Forces Clinical Research Advisor, is the former president of the American Art Therapy Association. Rounding out this illustrious group, we'll speak with Bob Woodruff, the world famous ABC News correspondent. In 2006, Bob was seriously injured by a roadside bomb while covering the conflict in Iraq. And just 13 months later, he was back on the air. And since 2015, he's been ABC's primary correspondent in Asia, traveling to North Korea eight times. In addition to receiving multiple Emmy and Peabody Awards, he also established the Bob Woodruff Foundation to raise money to assist injured service members, veterans, and their families. So we we'll look forward to that next week. But Dr. Patel, Ani, you've been a fantastic Thank guest. You. Thank Truly, you so I, it's fascinating to learn uh, about your work. Thank and you. we're going to leave you all with a couple of uh, videos, some, some of our favorites. Thank you so much. See you next week. Oh.